Peter Pan Live is one of those shows that I love to watch to hate. I get a sadistic pleasure reliving all the ways that this 2014 rendition fails so hard to beat even okay. But when I want to rag on something, this one is always a go-to. And when better to revisit my nemesis than when I'm a sad boy and ready to expose more of my obsession with the canon. I did a video on the show a while back that explored the broad ways that the characters were hurt or outright ruined through the rewrites and directing, but I still have plenty more to say on the work. In any work of storytelling, whenever you add a scene, song, detail, etc., you must always ask, what does this add to the work? In the 1973 Jesus Christ Superstar film, the song Could We Start Again brought the perspective of Jesus' followers as they're realizing the dangers and possible outcomes of their Messiah's arrest. The montage of the children and Maria adventuring through the countryside in the 1964 Sound of Music establishes their growing fondness for their governess and shows Maria having the time to learn about each individual child before throwing it in their father's face. Peter Pan Live has a lot of additions, but rarely do they add anything of purpose or enrich our experience of the story. In many cases, they hurt rather than help us enjoy the show. What's the point of hooking a song of all the things he wants after Peter is dead and him reflecting on what he could do instead of chasing the boy? Really, nothing except Hook making it really obvious that he wants the kid gone. True, it's response to the suggestion that Hook should just let go of his grudge. But that could have effectively been refuted by Hook stating, hell no, or the like, because he doesn't have to justify his actions to his crew. He's the captain. They are his dogs. Save the deep consideration for when he's bouncing ideas in private or with me. Why go so in-depth with the crew on his thoughts when the conclusion is going to be, I want him dead and that's the end of it? Was it really not good enough for killing Peter and his crew to be Hook's main ambition? His beef is with the boy who cut off his hand, not the island that he lives on, so why blow up Neverland? One could say that the island has negative connotations and reminds him too much of Pan, but what does this desire add to the story or character? Hook as a person isn't more rounded out or made more cruel. It more takes away elements like dulling his devotion to kill Peter, and this version as a whole does a lot to make him less menacing anyway, so I can't see him as more dastardly because of it. It's also so obviously tacked on as demonstrated through lines like Where does the added conflict of Wendy advocating for diplomacy over fighting Hook lead to? Aside from all the implications I listed in my previous video, a lot of time is spent on Peter and Wendy arguing over how to deal with the enemies only to get dropped after they free Tiger Lily. Are we supposed to assume only then did Wendy understand Hook's threat? No conclusion is reached and the dynamic is brushed aside so that the plot can continue in the fashion we all know and expect. And what's with the constant repetitions and reprising of lyrics and songs? Most of the numbers in the show are short and to the point, but here most of my favorites become boring songs as the same lines are repeated over and over, becoming nothing more than boring time fillers. We didn't need to hear Hook's plan to bake a deadly cake twice, or to experience the Lost Boys' multiple reprises of I Won't Grow Up to the point of the childish charm becoming rather obnoxious instead of a callback to the ignorant bliss of youth. I was and started to detail more iterations of needless additions to the show, but ultimately found that they were going in a different direction than I wanted to take the video. The point of this nitpicking is to demonstrate how Peter Pan Live not only fails as a performance of the Peter Pan musical, but also fails structurally as a musical and as a story. The moment where Peter's shadow suddenly becomes two and he starts dancing with both is outright immersion breaking. To enjoy musical theater, you need to have a certain level of suspension of disbelief to understand the characters aren't always singing their songs diegetically. And I can just roll with a lot of my fiction like accepting Hook's men can all play the instruments. But the shadows don't work here. As soon as I see them, I can only think of the scene as a person dancing along with the projection device you see outside of suburban houses in December because of how obviously they're not attached to Peter. It's made so much worse when they suddenly turn into doves, something that no shadow can do. True, shapeshifting was an ability of Peter's shadow in the 2003 film, but not every viewer has that context to draw from, and it's a huge ask to accept when we're still baffled by the fact that Peter has two detached shadows. A good part of my criticism on the extended slash added songs come from the Walt Disney and Steven Sondheim understanding of songs and stories. That musical numbers should advance the plot or characters in some way. 
That's why I struggle to watch older musicals where the songs are more of a break from the story at hand rather than an addition to it. In my mind, they need to say the things that can't just be easily done with dialogue. And Peter Pan already does that in previous versions. Songs are used to express the jubilation the characters are feeling, their models on life, the glory of Neverland, or to be a creatively in-universe way of Hook coming up with his next scheme. But in this one, that's not so. Hook getting a song about what he wants after Peter's death doesn't round him out as a person, but instead takes away from his menacing, one-track-minded desire to kill Peter. Pan's song about how it sucks for your parents to move on from you was already accomplished in him explaining with dialogue what he faced when he went home. We already knew Wendy was very sweet on Peter and how she acts around him, and the reflection of their relationship being pretend was already explored before Wendy decided to go home. So much time was wasted not just repeating lyrics, but also repeating notions already touched on in speech. Then you have the scenes that lead nowhere, like Peter and Wendy in the hallway outside the nursery. What we learn there is that the maid doesn't do her work, some momentary lip service to the hook and pan rivalry, and that Peter is being longing about something as he gazes out the window. Nothing is touched on later or is enhanced by the scene being there. In fact, you could delete the scene altogether, and nothing would change except for the comment Mrs. Darling makes about the maid sleeping instead of making pudding would have no payoff. The more time you demand of your audience, the more you should be enriching their experience of the story you're telling. But when you have scenes like this, or like with Tiger Lily and Wendy arguing about taking on Hook, you take your audience out of the immersion theater requires. It makes them remember that they're not in Neverland, and slowly they start to think that their time would be better spent elsewhere. Because of confusing moments like the shadows, the continual reprises, and the addition of songs and scenes without a point, we're left bored and feeling like the show is dragging. Peter Pan is a short and succinct musical. It gets to the point and hits each beat with only the precise amount of time needed to get across its most important elements. Many versions run for about an hour and 40 minutes, but Peter Pan Live goes on for about 2 hours and 10 minutes. You feel every second added in to reach this runtime as again the bits filling the gaps don't enhance the story or the characters in it. I can't personally say why the padding is there, but one could probably guess it was to fill a specific time slot the showrunners wanted. The Sound of Music, which NBC performed the year before, is a much longer show, running about as long as Peter Pan Live. That may have set a precedent in terms of the amount of possible ad slots that could be sold, especially for such a high-profile annual event. With all this in mind, there's a question that comes up. Could they have padded Peter Pan Live with good things? Scenes and songs that make sense and enhance the narrative? Well, there's a wealth of other versions that could have been used as sources, but then again, we have the concern of restating what the musical already does, and further creates the possibility of drastically altering key scenes that the show is known for. Really, I can't think of anything so substantial that would be a beneficial addition that could also make the runtime cross the two hours mark. I also can't even think of a combination of material that can do it. Perhaps more creative minds can, but I wouldn't be surprised if that isn't so. Either way, the live show that we got is very much one of the weakest additions to the Peter Pan canon, particularly in how it was presented. Thankfully, there's a wealth of other versions that don't suffer from such immense structural failings that I can turn to instead of Peter Pan Live. Let's cut to the chase. YouTube, they don't care about making sure you see the stuff that I make. So instead, check out this Discord invite link where you'll find a content stream with the things that I and my friends create, and you can also chat me up in my Not Vampire crypt. You can also find me on Twitter, Not Vampire, and at those places you can also find out when I do my sorta monthly live streams. Thank you very much for consuming this video, and until next time.